Thank you so much for coming to the OMIC session. We know we're competing with an absolutely gorgeous outside, not just the weather, but the scenery. So we're going to do our best to make this worth your while and remind you that there are four hours of daylight left after this. So you're in good shape. So we don't have any financial disclosures, but even if you're not an OMIC policyholder, if you don't mind filling out the yellow sheet, that helps us be able to keep coming. And there's some at the back and some here, and just make sure you get it to me um, before you head home. So today we're going to be talking about diagnostic error. And I'm going to start by giving you an overview of diagnostic a diagnostic error study I've been working on for a couple of years, and then I'm going to drill down into just the pediatric strabismus part of that. So I, I studied, uh, well, so first, how prevalent is diagnostic error in all patients? Two really great articles at, that looked at this uh, estimated 10 to 15 percent or 7 to 17 percent. If you read more and more about this, these are most likely underestimates of the problem. Obviously, the number of lawsuits related to diagnostic error is smaller than the number of diagnostic error cases. And a couple of, this is the hot topic in patient safety, by the way. They're not getting any attention for a long time. Diagnostic error is the big deal. So uh, a couple of recent studies, we don't have a screen here, so I'm going to have to get a, a, a neck ache. But it's the most frequent type of malpractice claim in the United States for all specialties. So it's a, it's a pretty big problem. You all are familiar, I hope not personally, but you've heard of the National Practitioner Data Bank. And the highest frequency, so the most common reports, severity meaning the most expensive reports, and patient harm in 25 years of data bank reports were all related to diagnostic error. And the CRICO data sharing project is out of Harvard's Risk Management Foundation, but includes now a lot of other uh, healthcare institutions. And 20% of their claims in a recent study were for diagnostic error. So when I looked at omics diagnostic error claims and payments, I looked at a seven-year period. And out of the 1,600 claims, 223 alleged diagnostic error. So we have a smaller percentage in uh, omics claim base, 14%, but 34% of all the payments were related to diagnostic error. So again, something that's really got our attention. If you look at the category, retina just jumps off the page. Uh, by far the largest number. And then there's a four-way tie between glaucoma, medical, which by, by is ocular manifestations of a systemic disease, oncology, and cornea. I separated endophthalmitis because we get so many questions about that at OMIC. You're very concerned about the rate. So we put that in its own category, and I put endogenous and endophthalmitis in that category as well. Um, so then I, I, for this meeting, I looked at just the pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus claims of that bigger study. So just like in ROP studies in general, there are not many claims. There are only 19 claims involving 14 patients. And the reason the claim number is higher than the patient number is that uh, patients who become plaintiffs, they often sue several doctors if they were involved, your practice, hospitals may be involved, certainly in ROP cases. So there'll be more than one defendant. And if there's separate claims with OMIC, we count that separately. There were only five, uh, sorry, five payments, but look at that whopping total. And I'm going to dig down into that a little more specifically. So only 7% of the number of payments, but 34% of the total amount paid. And as usual, pediatric ophthalmology has half of the top 10 payments ever for OMIC. So pretty scary. So what were the clinical conditions? Well, nobody's going to be surprised to see ROP up there. Six claims for four patients, and three out of the four patients led to payments, and obviously these were screening ones. We do have one open lawsuit about treatment. It's the first treatment lawsuit we've had because most of the babies haven't made it to the treatment stage. It's failure to diagnose ROP. But, so it continues to be a low-frequency, high-severity problem. Trauma cases had no payments, and you can see what conditions um, were in that trauma category, fracture, foreign body, and retinal detachment after trauma. Oncology, there were two pay payments. Again, both patients got a, a settlement. Uh, this was the highest 
payment in the entire pediatric group for glioma. And uh, the lowest of the five payments for it was $850,000. So glioma and ROP were all the payments, and they're all really high numbers. Medical, some uh, things you're not going to see every day. Um, and certainly, I hope you know, most ductal probes aren't leading to meningitis. Uh, there were no payments on either of those. Corneal ulcer, you are going to see a lot of those uh, patients presenting with those. And strabismus, and it was a failure to diagnose myasthenia gravis uh, allegation and that the strabismus surgery was unnecessary. I'm going to go through a little later in between Bob's case presentations, which, oh my gosh, I forgot. It's all about me. I forgot to introduce <laughs> your president-elect, my co-presenter, uh, Dr. Bob Wiggins, who's going to do the case studies. Uh, we have been just so fortunate at OMIC in the representation on our board of pediatric ophthalmologists, and I was absolutely thrilled to see Susan Day walk in the room, who's in the back. Yay, Susan. Uh, Denise Chambly is also on the board. She's not be able to be here at this meeting, but Bob Gold, who's your new secretary treasurer elect, is here. So currently there are three pediatric ophthalmologists on OMIC's board. You're very well represented. So Bob will be presenting some case studies in a minute. So those are the clinical conditions. I think I just have one more slide before he gets up. So I wanted to compare payments. So the first column is omics overall during that seven-year period, the big diagnostic error study of those 223 claims, and then the pediatric strabismus subgroup. So similar high amounts percentage paid. So there are a lot of lawsuits, and we look at how many of them really do we need to make a payment to close them. Overall, it's 19, but for diagnostic error, there are higher numbers. Uh, the range, um, as you saw, uh, that, that uh, glioma case had the highest ever, highest for diagnostic errors and highest for the pediatric cases. But look at the median, the middle, and the average payments in red. They're just so much higher um, for the pediatric cases. Um, obviously, if you end up with a bilaterally blind child, great jury sympathy, but these are by, they continue to be the highest paid claims we have at OMIC. Oh, sorry, I thought it might be interesting for you to see what age these pediatric patients were. Um, as you can see, the infants, ROP, medical problems, and glioma. Older children were trauma and glioma. Young adults, trauma and cornea. And then adult, uh, just the strabismus case. So Bob Wiggins is going to present the first case study. So this is our first case. Um, this is a case of unexplained vision loss, and you've probably figured out what it was from Ann's table. We'll, we'll think about it as unexplained for now. So this child uh, first presented to an eye care provider, an optometrist, at the age of six. Failed a vision screening test, uh, visual acuities of 2050 and 2060. Uh, the eyes were reported as being structurally normal and there was no significant refractive error, and of course, vision therapy was recommended. Well, some vision therapy was done. The child returned uh, later that year. The visual acuities were relatively stable. Uh, at this point, the optometrist uh, entertained a diagnosis. Is there some malingering uh, here? Um, is, it, is there some developmental delay, the child's just not cooperating well with understanding the visual acuity test, or is there some uh, binocular vision abnormality or psychotic dysfunction? Um, and so the plan here was orthoptic therapy. Well, the child didn't go back uh, to the first optometrist. Things weren't getting any better. and. Uh, here we are now um, uh, a few years later, and the vision has decreased to 2100, and the right eye is still uh, the same in the left eye, 2040. And you, you see the diagnoses here. You, you might imagine that, that there was an exotropia, to put it in the language we're familiar with, and uh, presumably they were thinking amblyopia in the right eye, but again, the plan listed was, was recommend vision therapy. 
But this optometrist was concerned enough that uh, he didn't, uh, wasn't quite sure what was going on here, that he referred the patient to a comprehensive ophthalmologist uh, for consultation. And so the history here was the child had been, uh, had decreased vision in the right more than left eye for a few years now, and now the visual acuity was 2200 in the right eye and 2040 still in the left. And this uh, ophthalmologist noted that the, the right optic disc appeared pale and, and hypoplastic, and there appeared to be trace pallor uh, on the left and diagnosed optic nerve hypoplasia. Uh, because of the child's age, did not recommend any uh, patching treatment, um, told the uh, family of the child to go back to the referring optometrist and continue with the, the, the vision therapy. Well, the, the vision therapy, whatever that was, was, was continued, uh, but uh, eventually stopped. The family didn't think it was helping and returned back to the ophthalmologist who is uh, omics insured. And the visual acuity uh, now was 2400 in the right eye, uh, down a little bit in the left eye, 2050 uh, plus. And uh, so again, we're a few years out after initial presentation now, felt the exam was stable, said come back in, in nine months. Uh, the uh, family did come back then, and again, the exam was felt to be stable, and uh, at this point, the comeback PRN. Well, the family came back the following year and um, said the child's doing worse. Uh, the vision was now hand motion in the right eye, and the left eye had gone down quite a bit, down to 2,400. And so the uh, comprehensive ophthalmologist now referred the patient to a neuro-ophthalmologist for consultation. So the neuro-ophthalmologist uh, found the vision was light perception in the right eye, 2400 in the left, uh, noted a 3-plus right afferent pupillary defect, which had not been noted on any of the exams uh, previously, noted the right exotropia, noted marked disc pallor more in the right than the left eye. There was no mention of optic nerve hypoplasia. And we did have some very poor images as reviewers to look at, and I, I'm not showing them here, but, but, but they, they did not appear to show hypoplasia whatsoever. They appeared to be normal-sized optic discs. So a head MRI scan was performed, and it showed this supracellar mass consistent with a chiasmal optic uh, nerve glioma. So a claim was filed uh, here, and, and once a, a claim is filed, um, OMIC will obtain, um, in a case like that, may get several uh, expert opinions. And the photos were reviewed, and they were felt to, sh uh, to show just pallor of the optic disc, not, not hypoplasia. Um, and so uh, there was a consensus among, there were three reviewers on this case, that this ophthalmologist did not meet the, the standard of care, both in terms of the original diagnosis um, and that uh, no afferent pupillary defect was noted in the chart. Um, an MRI scan was mandated for uh, optic uh, disc pallor, unexplained vision loss and, and optic atrophy. And that if the diagnosis had been made earlier, that perhaps the, the vision could have been stabilized with, with chemotherapy. So what was the, the outcome here? Well, the patient's outcome was chemotherapy was uh, administered once the diagnosis was made. And the vision a few years out uh, had remained stable at the point the chemotherapy was initiated. So light perception in the right eye and 2400 in the left. And this, this case was settled uh, for 850000 through uh, mediation. So uh, failure to diagnose. Uh, who remembers the, the guy in the lower right corner? OK, a few of you are as old as I am. <laughs> uh, my favorite Martian there was. So this is an uncommon condition, even for those of us that see it. This was a comprehensive ophthalmologist. Uh, my, guests have probably never seen a case of this. And even in a pediatric ophthalmology practice, uh, these don't come along terribly often. So you have to have your uh, antennae up. And, and think about how many kids we see with um, um, functional uh, vision loss relative to having an optic nerve glioma, where the, the discs may look pretty normal uh, early on, uh, particularly with those visual acuities recorded earlier. So, 
uh, missed opportunities, uh, unexplained uh, progressive vision loss, particularly with the uh, pallor that was developing in the, in the optic discs. Uh, given that, uh, and even the ophthalmologist recognized that the other nerve uh, had some pallor, uh, that no imaging was performed, and then there was no afferent pupillary uh, defect recorded in the chart. Um, so in these you know, circumstances, when things don't quite add, add up, just you have to ask, you know, do I need help on this case? What's that? Uh, that I don't know. That that wasn't evident from the from the record. One question: Do you know if that comprehensive ophthalmologist ever saw a child again? Maybe he decided not to see <laughs> children in the future. Um, I, I actually looked up this uh, when we're when we're doing reviews. It, it sometimes kind of helps to know a little bit about the person that, that you're reviewing. And so these days, of course, you can find out about anything by about any of us. And so I would say this, this ophthalmologist um, is because the, um, the content on the website identifies this as family eye care. So I would say yes. Um, so uh, I'm going to just show you a, a, a non-omic case that, that I saw uh, a number of years ago that reminded me very much of this case. Uh, this was a four-year-old boy who had, the family said had been running into objects for a year, been holding things uh, close. They noticed uh, jittering of the eyes also for about a year. And uh, he had had an eye exam a month uh, earlier with a comprehensive ophthalmologist who had diagnosed congenital nystagmus. And uh, the family requested a second opinion. So I, I saw the child a month um, uh, later. And the visual acuity was, was 2.30 uh, in each eye with the, with the Allen cards. Pupils were sluggish uh, bilaterally. Um, the fundi showed not hypoplasia, but somewhat small uh, optic discs that were pale uh, bilaterally. And the extra motility exam uh, showed bilateral um, seesaw uh, nystagmus. And uh, I would like to have shown you the video, but as I was looking at this case, I went back to our electronic health record, and I could not find where we documented that I could show this in public. So unfortunately, I can't show you the seesaw nystagmus. Um, uh, but I can show you the optic disc, and this child was a bit squirmy. We only got one side, uh, but the other disc looked just like this. Um, um, somewhat small, uh, but pale uh, optic discs. And this uh, child's uh, head MRI scan uh, showed a large um, mass that you can see there in the middle, the, the light white uh, area and the supracellar region just above the pituitary in the very middle of the scan. Um, that was responsible for this uh, child's uh, vision loss. And um, that child, unfortunately, had a, had a terrible outcome. Uh, he was referred to a university center, um, was felt to be getting some early compression of the third uh, ventricle at risk for hydrocephalus, and so they went in to uh, debulk this mass, which did turn out to be a, a glioma and the child had uh, massive cerebral edema uh, immediately after the surgery within the next day and herniated and, and, and died. So a terrible, uh, terrible outcome. Um, so just a little review of, of optic pathway gliomas since we don't see these terribly commonly. Um, they can occur sporadically as they did in the uh, last two children we talked about uh, more commonly. You might see them with a syndrome, neurofibromatosis, uh, type 1 is, the, of course, the one to think about. Uh, the onset is early childhood, as in these cases, um, chiasm, hypothalamic region commonly involved, or they may involve one of the optic nerves, or they may be less commonly retrochiasmal. Uh, in the presentation, commonly uh, decreased vision, uh, we, we were aware of that acquired asymmetric nystagmus. The, the one I showed you is is less common, the seesaw nystagmus. Um, but if you see that, think supracellar region. That's, that's where seesaw nystagmus tends to, tends to localize. But in the younger children, it's the spasmus nutans-like picture we're familiar with. Um, 
uh, in one study, a, a large study of children with uh, visual pathway gliomas, and children that presented under the age of two, 45% of them had that spasmus nutans like um, nystagmus. And, and that is the, the finding to look for, particularly in, in young children. We've talked about the other's proptosis, obviously, if it's in one optic nerve. Uh, the other glioma case that Anne uh, alluded to was a case that presented um, in um, about a year of age or, or so, as I recall. And, and that was a, uh, in fact, it was less than a year of age. It was um, a diagnosis of spasmus nutans was right. made. Uh, without imaging, and the child was referred back to the pediatrician. Basically, the whole um, was really lost to follow up. If it was sent back to the pediatrician, if the child's not doing well, refer back to me. If this doesn't resolve, but uh, of course, spasmus nutans, you know that link, you know from the from the boards, the OCAPs, so remember as residents, you know, think of ruling out uh, glioma. Bob? I'm uh, presenting that case tomorrow in the administrator's program, and what was so haunting when I reviewed the whole case was that when the ophthalmologist sent the letter to the pediatrician, he said, if this were an older patient, I would be worried about a tumor. But since this is a young, is an infant, I don't think any more workup is needed. So knew about that association, uh, but, but felt comfortable um, not working up that finding. And, and not following up to see if it did, did resolve. Exactly. Um. All right, Anne. By the way, if you came in later again, you want to make sure you fill out one of these yellow sheets. They should be in the back of the room. If not, there's some up here. Any uh, other questions about the first case? By the way, I was supposed to warn you, um, come to the microphone. We are being recorded, so you probably don't want to give your name and location. But please come up to the microphone so that the question is on the recording. So, sir, if you have a question, please come up. Um, I'd have to look. You know, often with optometrists, the practice is, uh, uh, is sued rather than the optometrist. They weren't our optometrists, so we may not have had a lot of information about them. But it's a good question. Um, I can find out if, if they were named. Yes, sir. I had a question about diagnostic errors and the, the uh, percentages you mentioned. Mm -hmm. What is the basis of that? In other words, you're saying one out of every five patients that comes to an eye doctor's office has a misdiagnosis for all comers, or what is the basis of the, that statistic? So the overall diagnostic errors were based on, there has to be some definitive finding to have the diagnosis be changed. So those were in all patients, not ophthalmology. Ours, it were 14% alleged a diagnostic error, and I'm going to go over later uh, what the standard of care evaluation was, because, you know, it's our national sport to sue physicians. So just because they sue you for diagnostic error doesn't mean there was a diagnostic error. But so in those studies, did a second person do a confirming exam? Uh, that, well, a lot of them were based on medical record reviews or uh, based on what was put into the National Practi Practitioner Data Bank report. So there was a confirmed different diagnosis. And that's why uh, they, they think that the number is, is much larger than that. Also, you know, not enough, not as many autopsies are done. So there's a lot of times where the patient doesn't come back to you, and you'll never know, unless you were sued later, that the diagnosis was different. So I'm not an expert on this, but everything I read says that the, the actual incidence of diagnostic error is higher. Okay. So... I didn't know this was the very next slide, but so what I did is I looked at which of these pediatric ophthalmology claims had expert reviews. Some of them are so obviously frivolous, they're dropped right away, and so we don't get an expert review. So the, the number in parentheses is how many cases were reviewed, and so 
I looked at did the expert say that the physician met the standard of care, was below, or mixed means there was more than one review and they disagreed. And I went with the assumption that all the experts for the plaintiff were going to be double thumbs down. So I'm only looking at the defense experts. What were their opinions? So um, in terms of negative or mixed, well, cornea, you know, one of one, that's not a, a very good sample study. But oncology, 100% uh, of both of those very, very much negative reviews. ROP, one mixed, but three negative reviews. Um, trauma, you know, some negative reviews. But of the total, 70% were mixed. And out of that, there were the five payments we've mentioned. Um, now, I mentioned that there, the uh, settlement rate isn't that high. So 70% of the cases, experts on the defense side felt that there were real problems in the care, and yet the average uh, no, uh, percentage settled in, in the pediatric ones was 28%. So just want to take a little comfort for you away from that, that it feels like you're big, you've got big targets on your back, but uh, even if the care's not perfect, we're still winning a lot more cases than, uh, than the experts think we should. So uh, some studies on what factors contribute to diagnostic error. So I looked at these two studies, um, and these are the, the typical factors that we look at, physician factors, system factors, and patient factors. And physician knowledge, judgment, vigilance, or memory, and we'll come back to memory. Systems issues have a very large role to play often in malpractice cases and in error. So was it about communication, coordination of care? We know coordination of care is a huge factor in ROP cases. Uh, was it the appointment test and referral tracking? Uh, I presented, um, I think I might have a case in the, the YO program tomorrow afternoon about referral tracking. Um, how many of you actually have a system if you send uh, a patient out for a consult that you have a tracking system that somebody's watching to make sure that the referral uh, letter comes back to you. So not everybody. It's a really big problem um, and can lead to a lot of harm. And then patient factors are both, uh, the clinical presentation, was it very rare, was it atypical, but also the non-clinical, i.e. behavioral issues. And with most of your patients, we're talking about their parents. So which had physician, which had patient, and which had systems issues. And um, if it's in a color, it means there was more than one case with this problem. So cornea, there was no differential diagnosis and a late referral. Oncology, Bob mentioned that the APD was missed. Uh, the fundus photos were misinterpreted. Imaging wasn't ordered. You see that shows up four times. Uh, Follow-up was too long, shows up four times in different types of cases. Um, so out of these 10, seven are physician factors. There were no patient factors in this tiny little group of, of cases that I looked at for this. And the ROP, there were some um, system issues. One was a, a hospital that had the ward secretary with obviously no clinical training being the one to uh, schedule the next ROP appointment. This has since been remedied. Um, but there was a misunderstanding about the way the physician had documented his findings that was interpreted to mean that no more screening was needed, and so the baby was never screened again. Um, the way the follow-up interval was documented, you can have just a moment where you're not paying close attention and write the wrong interval, and that's why we require physicians to not just say, see the baby again in two weeks, but give a date. If you're on an EHR system, that will hopefully prevent all those copy forward errors because we've had some cases where every practitioner seeing the baby in the hospital just cut and pasted and said in two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, well, until the baby was blind. So put a date in, an approximate date, if you don't do your exams on the same day of the week, but put a date in and it'll make it a little harder for anybody else looking at the record to ignore it. So, um, and the handoff, there was a, a case. Is that the one you're going to be talking about? I think we'll just skip that. Yes. Okay. 
So where in the diagnostic process did the error occur? I was really interested in this, and I did a, when I presented on these, an early part of my study in Illinois last year, and I was comparing retina and glaucoma, and it was interesting to see that they're in different parts of the, of the process. So the initial diagnostic uh, assessment, these are the categories that these studies give. And so in orange, these were some of the problems in these cases. So if the patient never comes to see you, you're off the hook. That's not the thing. But, but mostly it was from then on. So the history and physical, uh, if you're not competent to do an exam, you're, you're not off to a good start. If um, turns out the biggest problem in all of our diagnostic error study was failure to diagnose retinal detachment, can you think of what was missing in the initial assessment that that the RD was missed? A dilated exam. It's a little harder to see if you don't do that. Um, differential diagnosis. Again, this doctor in the other case of the glioma was aware that that was in the differential, but convinced himself it wasn't a problem. Um, and then the follow-up interval. In a number of these cases, the experts felt that it was, obviously the physician was not wor as worried as he or she should have been and was allowing very long follow-up periods, uh, sometimes up to a year long, with neurological findings, and that's very worrisome. So the second phase is test and results processing. Now, in ophthalmology, you're a little different than other specialties because you are doing many of the tests in your own office. If you think about if you were an internist, lab work would be sent out. A lot of the testing would be sent out, and so that you can imagine how many errors can happen there. The test wasn't done. The results weren't sent back. They were sent back, but you didn't see them, or they were misinterpreted. I'm reading a really fascinating book on clinical reasoning about how if you get a pathology report back that doesn't correlate with your clinical findings or you're still worried, the pathologist occasionally is wrong. And if you just you know, let the, your suspicion go because you get a reassuring path report, um, you know, it's, it's sort of frightening to think about, but you should always be a little vigilant on that. Uh, but in ophthalmology, you're going to do most of this except imaging and, and biopsies. So on this one, as we mentioned, the fundus photo was not interpreted well. Um, but, uh, you know, in the case I'm presenting, I think tomorrow, one of the problems was test results coming back, uh, not being received, and um, not being acted on. In fact, the, uh, the physician never saw them. The office administrator was the one who looked at all the results, decided whether to call or not, and then just kept them in a pile on her desk and the patient wasn't there, so it just kept going on and on and on, and by then a couple years had gone by, so it doesn't look good. The last phase is follow-up and coordination of care. So here, um, you know, if you don't follow up with the patient, and, and you really want to make these follow-up appointments before the family or the patient leave the office, even if they say, I don't think I can make that, then they're in your system and you're going to be tracking them. So never let somebody go. If you're ordering an outside uh, exam, consultation, or test, schedule a follow-up appointment. You can always cancel it, and you can always change it, but you want to make sure they're in the system to just trigger you to follow up on this. Um, three times there was no referral to a specialist. I'm asked, is there any liability for uh, referring to a specialist? The only possible liability is if you're referring to someone you knew or should have known was incompetent. You probably already know who those people are in your community, and please don't refer to them. <laughs> but absent that, you're always going to get dinged, not always, but you're often going to be dinged for not referring to a subspecialist, like a neuro-ophthalmologist, but uh, not for referring. So um, poor handoff can be a problem. Um, and you have to just uh, agree with your patient on what the ongoing follow-up plan is. Uh, and then uh, monitor the response. So where do you think in my little mini study of retina, adult retina and, a, and adult glaucoma, where were most of the errors in retina? Phase one, which was the initial assessment, phase two, testing, or three, coordination and follow-up? All right, you guys had too much fun. Uh, the initial assessment, all of the retina cases from the beginning, 
wrong. Just, you miss it at the first time, you're gonna keep missing it. In glaucoma, it was the exact opposite. There was a pretty good initial evaluation, and either the patient was put on steroids and the stero response to the steroids, the optic nerve wasn't monitored, or uh, a physician didn't notice a subtle increase, didn't go back, which is supposed to be easy with your EHRs, but didn't compare over time, and it was a very steady incline in the IOP and a steady increase in cup to disc ratio, but it was subtle, and the patient knew and liked the doctor, so over many years, he watched his patient lose significant vision to glaucoma. So glaucoma, it's in that monitoring phase, and retinet was in the early phases. And so Bob's gonna do case two. Any questions about that part of, the, of my talk? Okay, we'll go on to the next case. There were a couple of things I thought of as you were talking, and one I wanted to back up to the fact that I, I didn't show you the seesaw nystagmus, and I've gotten uh, probably hypervigilant ever since I'm on, <laughs> on this, this board and see all these cases. It's, it, it certainly makes you think about your, your practice very carefully, but um, I was almost certain I had a release on that patient, and uh, I, I can almost distinctly remember getting it, and um, but went back to the electronic health record and just could not find it in there. So th there's no proof, and you have to be, be careful, of course, with HIPAA. And we had a talk recently at, at OMIC about our reinsurer for the broad regulatory protection. You, you may or may not know that you also have coverage, $100,000, for other things that might uh, pop up like fraud and abuse um, or HIPAA violations. And we had one uh, that the reinsurer was talking about um, where a plastic surgeon had gotten sued uh, for HIPAA violation for before and after photos that were posted on their website. And um, I, I think I may have understood how this happened, but some of you that have more IT knowledge may know this, but I remember when I was first learning about IT, there's the HTML, kind of the code that's in the background, and there was no patient identification that you could see in the pictures, but what I understood him to say was when you looked at the code in the background, that patient's picture was identified as belonging to a certain patient in the practice. It could be seen. And so that um, came to light, that patient became aware of it. Oh, I you know, somehow saw your picture on the website and the uh, patient not given permission for that. So it's just something else to think of if you are posting patient pictures on your website, just make sure there's no way they can be identified or that you have gotten permission from the patient to post it. Um, the other thing I was, gonna, I was thinking of when you talked about um, retinal detachment being missed. I had one just recently. We, when I take call, we take call for the whole practice, so all comers. And a work in uh, for that day was, uh, and this is the way the tech had taken the history, was a uh, patient has a blister uh, on the lower lid. And so I was, I was looking at the patient, um, you know, behind schedule, trying to get through and thought, well, this is gonna be a quick exam. He's gonna have a chalazion or something. And it wasn't obvious looking at him, so I was looking at him with a slit lamp. He had a little bump on his lid margin, not impressive. I said, you know, this is on your lower lid. He said, well, he said, that's, um, uh, that's right, it's on, it's on the lower lid. And um, his vision was 2040, whereas it had been 2020 in the past. And so I it was somehow just thought, well, let me look at his, through his pupil, non-dilated exam. And you could just barely see the edge of a superior retinal detachment uh, there. And the complaint nowhere was listed as loss of vision. And I said, you say you have a blister on the lid? He said, well, when I called in and explained it, the triage nurse says, you have a blister on your lid, your lower lid? And he said, well, I guess that's what it is. But he meant he was seeing a blister in the uh -huh. area of his lower visual uh -huh. field. And I thought how easy that would have been to have missed that uh, retinal detachment, a totally misleading history that was taken by the technician and then sort of confirmed by the by the patient well emergency call um, uh, we all run into this um, 
This was a 10-year-old boy who sustained an injury to his left eye. Uh, he was seen by the pediatrician. Uh, the pediatrician's uh, history is the, the family said they, he was uh, hammering a penny in the garage and they thought uh, he might have gotten a piece of metal in the eye. Well, you can just imagine the exam in this pediatrician's office. You can imagine it probably in your own office. The child's writhing around in pain. You can't get a vision. You're trying your best to examine this patient. Uh, the pediatrician sees a subconjunctival hemorrhage, uh, puts some fluorescein in, does not see uh, an abrasion, and calls the uh, pediatric ophthalmologist who's on call. And I went back, because I said, I know exactly what day of the week this was. It was Friday, so I went back and see, of course, you go back to your calendar. I said, sure enough, this was Friday afternoon when this call came in, because I had one just like this a week ago, and it's 5 o'clock, and you think, okay, I'm okay, and then at 4.59, the call comes in from your triage nurse. There's a patient calling. So I, I said, I, we, we've all seen this. I said, I know this was a Friday afternoon. And so the, um, the call goes in, and this is where the, the pediatricians and the ophthalmologist version of the call are different. And this is a tough situation when you don't end up seeing the patient, um, and this ophthalmologist uh, didn't see the patient. How do, you, how do you document that? Because there's no chart to, to record something in. Maybe, Ann, you can give us some advice of, of what you do in this situation or what you'd recommend. We have a form for that on our website called an after-hours contact form. It's in a document called Telephone Screening of Ophthalmic Problems. Uh, and it just it prompts you to ask questions so that if it's uh, 4.59 on Friday and you want to get out quickly, you'll still have to, you know, ask a bunch more questions. Um, so... It, we do have a form on our website for that. And you don't create a chart. You just keep a folder of either at, called after hours slash ER calls, and you keep that folder for the same period of time that you would keep your own records because that may save you. We have had plenty of cases where the ophthalmologist's only involvement was a phone call, and he never saw or, or she never saw the patient. So, Would, would you recommend, in addition, dictating something so there's some time stamp that you didn't go back and recreate this, this phone record after the claim is, is filed? You know, that's a good point um, because, yeah, you're not going to have, uh, you're not going to be able to look back. It's never a bad idea, but, again, I, I want it to be user-friendly. If you've got something with today's date and there's no reason to suspect, I mean, the plaintiff attorney will try and, and trip you up, but I think that's pretty defensible, um, you know, to just document it because especially if it, I, I think that's, that's good enough. And then if you hear back later, you add to it, and that'll show that it was done later. But... But you're right, you, you hang around OMIC long enough, you get a little more careful. Yeah. <laughs> I said I'm paranoid about crossing the street. Um, so, um, as we said, and this is again the documentation part, there, there was no documentation, as I think probably a, a lot of us do when this, when this patient never shows up in your office. You get this call from the primary care doctor of the ER. The ophthalmologist version is, um, and I'll be happy to see the patient in the emergency room uh, this evening, uh, said there was no mention of metal on metal contact um, during this conversation with the pediatrician. The pediatrician says, well, you know, yes, I, I did tell you about that metal on metal uh, contact. Uh, there was agreement that there was a recommendation to place the patient on topical antibiotics, and the ophthalmologist uh, said that if the vision and the subconjunctival hemorrhage were not getting better by the next day, the patient should follow up with the pediatrician or go to the emergency room. Well, here it is, and now you know what day of the week this is. So it's now Monday, and the uh, parents have brought the child in to another uh, comprehensive ophthalmologist, not the one that took the call. And you can see the, uh, it's, it's a disaster within the eye uh, at, at this point. Um, the vision's uh, poor. Uh, it was an 80% um, uh, hypopion and uh, the suspected foreign body uh, CT scan obtained. And you can see this, this eye had the works, just about everything you can, you can do to the eye, um, and then required a, a penetrating uh, keratoplasty and secondary uh, implant. 
So um, the plaintiff's expert uh, here, so a claim was filed. Uh, the plaintiff's expert said that uh, the patient should have been uh, mandated to be seen by the ophthalmologist that night, not to offer, but to say, I, I need to see that uh, child. Um, and that, again, this is a pediatrician working with an uncooperative child, easily could have missed a small penetrating uh, foreign body. Defense expert says, well, if, if the insured ophthalmologist's version of the phone conversation is correct, well, then, then this case uh, you know, perhaps could be defended. And this was the outcome here. The, the vision that at last visit we had was count fingers in the left eye, and you can tell things are just going to get worse. The pressure's up. The graft is failing. Um, the, uh, and this was the outcome here. So the, the pediatrician did uh, settle uh, for an undisclosed uh, payment. The arbitrator did find uh, in favor of the insured, um, and, uh, but it took quite a bit to defend this case. This was a, this was a lot of time involved defending this case and money. You can see $268,000, uh, but uh, OMIC did uh, stand behind the, the ophthalmologist uh, here. So, we all run into this. You're called by the ER doctor, the primary care doctor, and they say, I think the patient can be seen the next day. So there you are. Do you, do you take their word for it? Uh, do you, um, how can you tell if that doctor's competent to, to make that call? And I love this picture here at the top because it, it reminds me of probably the way a lot of these primary care doctors are looking at the eye because we have family practice residents rotate through our clinic and I'm teaching them how to use the ophthalmoscope. Like this fellow, they don't ha have their finger on the dial. They're, they're standing about this distance away and you can imagine you're the patient and I uh, say, no, you've got to get up you know, close to the eye. Um, Here's another one, and this, this is again one, and I, I, I tell you these things I've gotten hypersensitized to, so I want to pass it on uh, to you so you can be paranoid too. Um, your practice employs optometrists. Uh, how many of you employ optometrists in your practice? So quite a few. And um, we have um, uh, some of our optometrists are seeing patients out in their own satellite. There's no ophthalmologist there. Uh, patients come in uh, uh, emergently and um, so we have a protocol and this is again based on uh, OMIC and other practices that are uh, that are doing this and uh, we have a list of things what are the things that an optometrist can see on an emergent basis in our practice and that might be acute conjunctivitis it might be a corneal abrasion uh, but then we have things that uh, these you must call and refer the patient on to an ophthalmologist and just think of some of those things, angle closure glaucoma, to name some obvious ones, orbital cellulitis. And we have those things listed. These are examples of things you must refer on to the ophthalmologist. And, and then we have, just in case that optometrist were to get a call from the emergency room and our main office, um, um, a call from the emergency room physician, for instance, uh, or um, less likely the hospital ward asking that a patient be seen. Well, you can't, you, you must turn that call over immediately to the ophthalmologist. We don't even want you taking a message and pass, passing it on. You just say, I'm not qualified to take this call. I'm going to get the ophthalmologist its own call. So we have this all laid out in a uh, protocol. We have all the optometrists in our practice uh, sign this. Because uh, in many of these cases uh, where an employee in your practice gets sued, whether it's an optometrist or a technician has done something, uh, the ophthalmologist will often get named, the entity gets named, they, they say the, it's called vicarious liability, you're responsible for your uh, employees. So if you have some documentation like this, it helps uh, protect you as the, as the ophthalmologist. So. We all learn in medical school, do no harm, but uh, it's also our obligation to make sure others do no harm. So we have a document called Coordinating Care with Optometrists. It includes surgical co-management. It includes the situations Bob is describing. So we've developed a sample protocol for you. 
tell you how to credential the optometrist, so it's on our website, which is an open access website. So we're gonna look a little more closely at the physician factors in these diagnostic error claims. As I mentioned, they're the main driver in both omics overall diagnostic error claims and the pediatric ones. So we're gonna look at these categories. You've probably read this delightful book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, and all the studies on clinical reasoning look at how are you thinking when you're, you're making a diagnosis. So when you're first learning something, you go very slowly. But once you have some experience, you start doing things more automatically. Um, and this is one of the benefits of experience, and without being able to go a little more quickly, you'd never be able to see all your patients. Let's face it, you can't do a very deliberative, uh, you know, detailed exam on every patient. But um, it only really works well if it's a common condition that presents in the typical way. And a lot of the diagnostic error studies show that they're common conditions, but that they present atypically. And the recommendation is that residents need to be taught atypical presentations of common conditions because they get it so fixed in their head what this should be, and if there's any outlawing symptom, they immediately uh, rule out the common condition. So these are called cognitive shortcuts and biases, and they help, but they're a trap as well. And um, I mentioned the, the training and knowledge gap but so slow thinking is very deliberative and rational. And if you're faced with a very complex presentation and you really are wondering what in the world it is, you're gonna slow down. Um, if it's, but the problem our sh study shows is that it's obvious that physicians don't know when they need to slow down. They have a lot more confidence in themselves than they should. So, um, and the example of, you know, if, if you're in a difficult situation, slow down. If uh, everybody's had the experience of finding themselves already at work and not knowing how you got there in your car because it's so automatic you're not paying any attention. But ideally, in bad weather, it's much more deliberative. You're slowing down. You're paying attention. Um, so to use a really dumb automotive metaphor, when do you need to apply the brake and slow down? So let's think about that a little. So a really good clue is can you explain what's wrong? The Institute of Medicine just came out with a really great study, um, improving diagnosis in healthcare, and the main emphasis in this whole book is the patient. They classify something as a diagnostic error if you didn't explain it to the patient or the explanation didn't make sense to the patient. So this is a really good test for you. Um, and there I'm quoting the, that thing. So, um, and their recommendations from this book is explain to patients that a di the diagnostic process is a process. You're not necessarily gonna know right away. You're trying to come up with a working diagnosis that allows you to move forward, either to do more testing or try uh, a treatment. Um, so tell what your working diagnosis is. As in this case that Bob presented, if you recognize that it's unexplained vision loss, say, I'm not really sure what's going on here. And actually, that physician uh, wrote a lessons learned letter to us and said that he's, this has been a, a real awakening for him and that if he doesn't know what the cause of the vision loss is, he tells the patient that, he calls his colleagues and say, hey, have you ever seen this? And he's very prompt to refer. So it's go a good idea to say, I'm not sure what this is. I think it might be this, but I really don't know. So you have to be able to both explain it to yourself and, and your patient. I'm ahead of myself on all my slides, so I couldn't remember if I put that in or not. Um, now, the, the opposite problem is the patient comes in and already knows the diagnosis and is trying to convince you. Um, and you know, sometimes it's, it, you've gotta be real world. You may not have the time to have a lengthy <laughs> debate with a, a Google MD. Um, but, but, but this is a good rule of thumb. It's a good thing to keep in your mind. So the other thing is to get a second opinion from yourself, to sort of remind yourself to slow down. So ask yourself some questions. Could this be something else? And if it's something else and I'm wrong, what don't I want this to be? We don't talk about the problem of overdiagnosis much, 
Uh, it was kind of mentioned in the Q&A this morning, um, but you know, that you're worried and so you're gonna do more than you need to do, like lasering all the babies because if you think they may not come back, which I'm not sure is a bad idea, but um, so just because you're entertaining the worst case scenario doesn't mean you're gonna do every test to rule it out, but you just have to have it in your mind and think, you know, what's the likelihood, what do I need to do? Be open to unexplained findings. Almost always we find that there are some findings or symptoms that are not accounted for in the diagnosis and are kind of just set aside. You should, it's called coherency. Your diagnosis should be coherent. It should be able to explain most everything. And if it doesn't, at least think about that. Um, and then accept uncertainty. You know, you're, again, you, you often may never get to know if your diagnosis was absolutely right, but you're gonna have a working diagnosis, and if the treatment seems to be working, the patient's getting better, you're not gonna do all the definitive tests to prove it, you just wanna make sure it's, it's effective. I was at uh, the American Board of Ophthalmology Centennial, and Susan Day gave a wonderful talk there, and the keynote speaker was um, Bob Wachter, who's, who coined the term hospitalist. He's uh, just a big, big name in the patient safety movement, and he had this really provocative statement that I've thought about ever since. If you're not sure it's right, assume it's wrong. And he was talking about a culture of safety, and he said, what you want, everybody, if there's a near miss, if you have a stop the line culture, and your technician comes up and says, Dr. Wiggins, I'm just not sure this is right, and you stop everything, or in the OR, you stop everything. He said, you know you have a culture of safety if you stop everything, and that person was wrong, there was no error, and they get a letter of recommendation in their file for stopping the line. Because you'd rather have them question it more and it be all right than not feel like they can question it. And you know, when you talk about relying on your staff, if you give the impression to your staff, if you say, if you have a question, interrupt me, and then you bark at them every time they interrupt you, they're not gonna interrupt you. If you're barking at the nurses in the OR and they think something is wrong, they're not going to tell you. So it's tricky. You have to have a balance again, and uh, you know I'm not sure how to exactly get there. But to remember that uh, you know if you're not sure it's right, assume you're wrong, and then again just look at it again, think it through again, and remember that the error can be anywhere along the line. So after I my study showed that it was mainly physician factors. I thought about it again and came to the conclusion that it's the system, stupid. Um, what working conditions would be needed for you to really be able to do a, 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 an adequate job diagnosing a patient? Um, you know, you have to be able to focus on it. And one of the things I've come to realize I think is one of the biggest problems is interruptions. How many times are you, I just told you, let your staff ask you questions, but not while you're diagnosing. Do you know nurses in hospitals, when they're preparing medications, they have a sign on their back that says, do not disturb preparing medications. And I think you need to get little safety vests that say, do not disturb diagnosing the patient. You don't want your staff coming in. You don't want to be looking at your little iWatch computer. You don't want to be looking at your cell phone. You don't want to be calling me and getting pulled out because all the research shows that there's a tiny bit of information that you can maintain in your memory that you need to be able to be thinking through all those signs, symptoms. And if you're interrupted, the incidence of medication errors just skyrockets. And I bet the incidence of diagnostic errors goes up as well. So I think you really have to think about ways to ensure some time where you're not being interrupted. The other thing is I just read a study last week uh, about what's the relationship between difficult patients and diagnostic error. Well, you won't be surprised to learn that there's a much higher incidence of diagnostic error with difficult patients. It's not because they're annoying the hell out of you and you don't want to talk to them. The study showed physicians spent as much time, but the behavior took up so much brain space that they didn't have the brain with, literally, the bandwidth left to look at the clinical findings. So I think try and not be interrupted um, is the main, now, that might not be easy, but really think about it, especially your own practice. I know that, I, you know, that iPhone was going off all during the meeting, and I don't need to see those 
every second. So there are some resources uh, on the website. Now we'd like to take any and all questions. Please come up to the microphone. Again, you're being recorded, so you might not want to identify yourself. Uh, but we're happy to answer any questions about the talk, any questions about risk management, any comments about what we've said. I've never had a talk where there weren't questions. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Alan Richards. Uh, very good. I had so, a couple of questions about two things, the uh, phone record and keeping up with consultations. You know, we don't live in a paper world, most of us. Maybe I'm in the minority, but I like computers, and I don't like paper at all. Mm -hmm. Computers keep things, and I lose papers. And I never can keep them seven years, particularly a little piece of paper from a phone call on Friday. At, and, and the thing is, we got iPhones. Now we get phone calls or text from Saturday Patience. 2 in the afternoon. You're at a ball game. I think it would be helpful to have both those things somehow electronically instead of a paper form, maybe even an app. Because most of us have our phones. We don't have pieces of paper everywhere mm -hmm. we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a way that OMIC can create an electronic form of one phone calls after hours, not just recommendations, but patient name, what you did? I mean, honestly, I think most of us know what you got to ask. I mean, it's helpful to have your question, but I think most of us know what we need to ask. The problem's not that we don't know what to ask is the problem is we don't document. What you what do we're, ask. We're, mm -hmm. Everybody here is well trained. They know what to ask on Friday afternoon. But do we write it down so a year later or three years later we have it? No problem. I don't. And uh, keeping up with consultations in lab, that's very difficult. I don't know how to do that. And if you can help, that would be great. I can't, but maybe you <laughs> can. Um, there is, and I can tell you, our computer, uh, our electronic health record isn't set up for it yet, but it's, it's supposed to be with the next upgrade. There is a, a meaningful use measure. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the meaningful use measures, you know, we don't find a lot of value in, but this is one that's, that's actually out there that I think has some value, and it's called closing the referral loop. Mm -hmm. And so you send a patient out. And if you haven't gotten back something logged back into your system and check that off within some period of time, then there's some alert that comes in the system. And I, th I think that will be very useful. Um, on the other hand, um, Ann and I have had a conversation by, by email recently um, with the interoperability. They say that one downside of interoperability with everybody sending these electronically back and forth now is that physicians are complaining that their inbox right. has grown like this because things that maybe doctors might not have communicated with each other before they're now sending everything on to every doctor and so now you've got hundreds of um, electronic correspondence to go through and and um, find out which ones were the most meaningful but then attach them to the to the chart um, what we do in our clinic uh, currently with the uh, referrals and with the labs uh, because I also do neuroophthalmology and um, those are very concerning to me when they don't get back and and even though the hospital's pretty good about it um, I'd say you know one out of 50 times, you know, we never get the, the lab or the MRI report back. And so we have a logbook that we keep every time we send a patient out for a consultation uh, to a neurosurgeon or a neurologist, uh, or we uh, send a lab out or an MRI scan. Uh, there's a paper record that we're currently keeping until this electronic system is, is ready. And the techs go through that every day, and they're crossed out or highlighted in yellow when we have the lab back and I've reviewed it and it's gone into the electronic record when I've uh, typed it in uh, to that. So that's that's our system and if there are ones you see that are you know not highlighted uh, they, they stand out uh, because the ones around it are all highlighted. Why is this lab not back? And uh, I also use the default um, I think it's it's good to have the patient come back um, but um, Sometimes I don't, 
And I, I tell the patient, if you haven't heard from me within X period of time when I think the lab or the MRI should be back, uh, to give me a call. So that's, that's another way to try and make sure that you know, there's, the patient's not assuming. It's, it's amazing how many patients I ask that come to, have been referred to me and they say I had an MRI scan. I say, well, what did it show? And they say, well, I assume it was normal because mm -hmm. I never heard back. And that's terrible. I mean, I said, don't ever assume that from me if you don't hear back from me that it's normal. Assume that we have dropped the ball somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you'll need to go to the uh, mic because we won't be able to hear it. Or maybe come up here to our mic. And while she's coming up, by the way, this is a huge, no, you'll have to come down to mine. Come all the way down here. It's a huge problem. And um, I just was at a, a conference where there was a study done in a big office practice group. And the work process has completely changed with the HR. Your staff were sorting through a lot of things and bringing it to you already attached to other parts of the record for your signature. It's a really big problem. So I don't know the answer yet, but I know we know it's a problem now. Regarding the phone calls, you have a smartphone. On most smartphones, you can actually, after you hang up, you can actually, there's a way to dictate a message to yourself on your phone that's, that gives you a, a, an audio file. And you can email that to yourself in the office, put it in your chart. Or a Google Calendar, put an event, and put a quick synopsis okay. there. And Thank those you. are good ways to document it. Thank you. Yeah, these are, these are really big problems. By the way, if you haven't read the book, The Digital Doctor by Robert Walkman, who I mentioned, uh, before, it's, it's really chilling, but brilliantly written about the negative impact of uh, EHR on patient care. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so I have a question about patient photos on websites. I went to, a, it was actually another risk management company that put on a symposium up in Sacramento. It was mainly on your online profile and patient reviews and how you can handle that and what you can say and what you can't say. And you really can't say anything. And they also said you were not supposed to put any patient's picture on your website, even if it's unidentified, or on your Facebook page or any other media. They said it was a HIPAA violation. It's, it's not. So what you have to do is get permission, and I would find a way to put on each photo where you have permission and make sure you've documented it, but um, posted with patient's permission or shown with patient's permission. So absolutely, patients are the one who have the right to say whether you can or can't share it at a meeting, uh, on the website. Uh, in the book, if you're in a plastics office, there's often a book of before and after photos. But it's if the patient says yes, it's not a HIPAA violation. So you, you definitely can do it. Yes, sir. A question and a comment. So just to clarify, so on your website, you have specific documents for optometrists that you employ for them to fill out, and then they would sign off that they did that, and then also for staff that triages patient calls? Right. So the, um, the document about optometrists works both for optometrists in your practice and if you're co-managing with optometrists in the community. So it's for any relationship with optometrists, and it's called coordinating care with optometrists. And the one that has some uh, training on telephone screening for staff with sample uh, urgent, emergent, and routine appointments by uh, eye complaint, that's called telephone um, screening. Great. And then just my comment, I have CompuLink in my practice, and they have a nice feature which probably other systems have called To Do. And so if I refer a patient to a cornea doctor for Meesman's, I don't send myself a note because if they don't go, it's not the end of the world. But for anything with a serious lab studies or MRI, I just send myself a To Do, and I never click that off until it's resolved. So just a way to track the more serious uh, referrals. Thank you for that suggestion. And, you know, if you can't do everything, talk to the risk manager of your liability company to do a, on the phone a quick risk assessment and at least track patients with potential neuro conditions, for example. So you're going to pick your really high risk ones and track them and, and get a system going on that, and then you can add more conditions in. Yes, sir. I would never put a picture of any of my patients on my website, but there are online journals. And I have one in which I have 17 full-face photographs demonstrating you can do a very large recession of the inferior recti, and if you handle the surrounding tissues correctly, it doesn't change the lower lid level at all. But that's 17 full-face photos in an online journal. Boy, I have documentation like you couldn't imagine Absolutely. from the parents that we can do that. 
No, it's really important because of all the, you know, PHI data out there, photo is probably the most compromising, and especially if it's a plastics procedure. Um, not that it isn't always obvious that somebody's had something done, but they may not want everybody to know. Um, other questions? So please uh, turn in the yellow form um, before you go. Thank you so much for coming to our session. And thank you, Bob, for a great job. <laughs>